Hey, I'm Fight the Flat Earth and welcome back to the channel that hides stupidity's EpiPen and then throws peanuts at it. As this is Sleeping Warrior Week, today is Sleeping Warrior's second episode of Flurfs Are Idiots. And this means he takes the title of being the first Flurf in existence to get two episodes. And you know what? I can guarantee that this will not be his last. Sleeping Warrior is the biggest idiot of them all. He thinks he knows what science is, says that only his version of scientific method is valid and claims that Density is a force. He can't work out the internal angles of a triangle without a calculator and claims that negative numbers aren't a thing. You can't get more of a perfect example of Dunning-Kruger than Anthony Riley. So join me and Team Skeptic as we prove that Flat Earthers, and especially Sleeping Warrior, are fucking idiots. We're living on a disc, floating through space, with a tiny sun. Yeah. This is a double length episode, so pause the video right now, go make a cuppa and come back with something to protect your face with because you will be face palming, uh, like, like a lot. Before we start, I wanna let you know what's coming up for the rest of the week. Wednesday, me and five fellow debunkers are doing the roast of Riley, a live ripping apart of Anthony Liley. Thursday is the top 10 dumbest things ever said by Sleeping Warrior. Friday is me versus Riley round two. There's also some more from me, videos from Planner Walk, Godless Engineer, the Casual Spaceman, The Creaky Blinder, Conspiracy Cats, AB Science, MC Toon, Bob the Science Guy, and more. All right then, let's do this. Okay, so when the eclipse happened in 2015 in England, I took some photos on my phone, couldn't see the moon. Oh, fuck me, I don't know if I can do this. Sleepy Warrior is talking about the partial eclipse on March the 20th, 2015, which peaked at 97% coverage, but only a viewed from the Shetland Isles. And Lily is saying that, that the moon wasn't there you know, in front of the sun. I don't know if I've got the strength for a whole week of this. Riley, what do you think caused the eclipse? When the eclipse in 2017 was due to happen, I was on Sun and Moon Group and I told everyone to go looking at the moon and see if anybody could see it. And when we got the results back, we didn't know what we were expecting, but we knew that we were gonna be looking for the moon. All the evidence indicated that the moon was not present. Uh, then soundly pops up with Earthshine, and Earthshine was ridiculed and laughed at. It was a setup trick from the start because you can't get Earthshine. And and now he's denying that Earthshine is the thing. I mean, how much reality do you want to ignore? But soundly claims to have got it. Miles Davis also claims to have got it. So I tried to recreate a light source and then an eclipse to see what would what we should expect if we see an eclipse. So I've managed to get my glass ball ordered from America. Um, it's got imperfections, which is perfect for what I want. I've got a, um, a telescopic variable focal LED light. I've got a laser and I've got my normal plate. It's just a normal white plate that everybody can get. It's porcelain, I guess, or... I don't know. Are you going to do what I think you're going to... Please, please don't do what I think you're going to do. Please don't try and use a torch and a crystal ball to simulate the sun and use the plate as a moon. Please, Lily. People watching this might hurt themselves. Basically, the ball through this. And what's going to happen is it's going to create an image on the wall, but it's going to be three-dimensional, just like our sun. My God, I don't, I don't know where to start. You're trying to make a 3D image of a sun on a 2D surface using a crystal ball and a torch. My fuck. <laughs> so, I'll try and do it so that it's... There we go. There we go. Now, all I'm doing there is creating a three-dimensional sun or a three-dimensional moon or a three-dimensional planet. And what you can see is that if I vary different elements of the light, I can get it to change its, its position. Now you can see there's a blue aura around it. Guys, I'm broken. He's he's broken me. I, I know what's coming up. Please, please send help. This is hard to watch. Painful, even. Now, I don't know if the camera's going to pick this up, but what I'm going to try and do is show the elements, the, the artifacts of the glass ball, or the imperfections of the glass ball, and get them to produce on the, the wall. There we go. Now, I'm hoping that you can see that. Because 
they now look like sunspots. They look just like the sunspots. Wait, 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 wait. I'm gonna have to break this down because that level of stupidity actually takes some time to process. So you're shining an LED torch through a crystal ball and seeing some artifacts which you say look like sunspots. So is the image on the wall the sun? Is the torch the sun and you're saying it shine through a glass ball and you're seeing a projection? Seriously, help me. How do you come to these conclusions? You dim-witted, mentally deficient window licker. Stop assault in the IQ of the planet by uploading your drivel to the internet, please. And the sunspots change over time. So it's almost like a glass ball is moving and the sunspots are part of the glass ball being projected onto the firmament and we're on the other side. Imagine that we're on the other side looking up. So we're looking up towards the light and seeing this on the, on the other side of the wall. Oh, so now there's a fucking firmament as well. Come on, man. We all know you don't believe in gravity. So if there's a firmament, you need to explain the pressure gradient to me right now. We do not live in a magic snow globe. Now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to recreate the eclipse using the plate. And the whole point of this is to take a picture of it to see do we get the imagery that we got. Now, this is where it's going to get awkward. Kind of need three hands. But if I get my light source, aim it onto the wall, and then I pass my plate in front of it, if I get the right size, I can create totality. Oh, let's just get this into the right place so that it can be seen. Right, where's the ball? There's the ball there. Bless him fumbling around to get it lined up. This is hard to watch. Like, you know those super cringe moments in comedies where you can't even look at the screen? Yeah, I imagine that's a lot of you right now. And I have a feeling that he is missing the entire point here anyway. Let's continue. The question becomes, do we have any element of the eclipse? Earthshine. Earth, Earthshine. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. I think you need to go to the remedial classroom to learn what Earthshine is because it's not artifacts on a plate shadow. All right, class, settle down. Wait, where are Mr. Riley and Mr. Oakley? What, they wanted to go and hide in their echo chamber. Is this because of the George Musser interview? <sighs> he said that George Musser's picking on him and he wanted to go and pretend that he's won? Well, that was stupid. He can't win anything. Not even a loser's competition. He's come second twice in dumb fuck of the year. Mr. Pratt, take notes from Mr. Riley. He needs this lesson more than most. Why, why not? Oh, you, you can't read or write. Anyway, Earthshine. Earthshine is the visible light from Earth reflected off of Earth onto the dark side of the moon. This allows you to see the details of the dark side of the moon when you normally wouldn't. Most noticeable during the waxing or waning phases of the moon. So, sunlight is reflected off of the Earth onto the night side of the moon, making the night side of the moon glow faintly and the entire disk of the moon is dimly lit. So there is no reason at all Sunspots should be seen during Earthshine. Now, everybody go and watch the interview with George Musser so they can tell Riley how wrong he is. No, no, I'm, I'm not ready yet. The stupid is just too strong. I need a coffee to calm my nerves. Team Skeptic, you got this, yeah? Hey guys, hey fight. As always, I'm happy to help with fighting stupidity. Sorry it took so long to get you this video. When you said Sleeping Warrior Week, I didn't realize the boredom that comes with watching Lily would literally make me want to sleep for a week. So let's begin. This is an egg. This is a parts per million counter. Inspired by Jaron's most recent video, if you haven't checked it out, go to his channel and it's called something like How and Why I Drink Distilled Water. Um, he used one of these and he measured the amount of particulates per million in his tap water. I decided that I could apply what he used, this little bit of technology, not science, this is technology. I could apply this technology and I could perform a practical scientific experiment where I could measure the density of medium, in this case water, 
and I can make this egg move all by itself with just a little bit of salt. As most of you know, Anthony Riley suffers from Dunning-Kruger, or maybe it's just mass stupidity, most likely from his years of education at Nathan Oakley's Institute of Independent Variables. And what's the deal with all these flat earth idiots wearing butcher smocks in their videos? I can observe my phenomena to be that some objects appear to float, some objects appear to sink, some objects will suspend in different mediums. My hypothesis is if I change the medium's density, the egg will move. Newton said, if an object moves, a force is present. My null hypothesis is that if I change the, if I change the density of the medium, the egg will not move. I will activate one of the hypotheses. We will eventually get to what he gets wrong about the scientific method later in this video. However, I would suggest that the next time he is at Walmart, he returns his waiter's outfit for a dictionary. More than one hypothesis is not pronounced hypotheses. It's hypotheses, you idiot. My independent variable, my presumed cause that I must manipulate in an experiment, is the density of the medium. My dependent variable, is the movement of the egg. I'll also try and keep everything else constant. The volumes of water, not no change, just the density of the medium. Let's see how I'm gonna do this. This is my egg. This is my parts per million counter. This is gonna measure the parts per million of both these fluids. This is tap water, regular tap water. That is the same tap water, but it's been preloaded to save some time with some salt from this to give it a density variation. It's going to measure the density of the, the tap water. Well, there's your first problem right there, sleeping scientist. A PPM meter does not read density of anything. It reads the concentration or the presence of particulates of a certain size in a solution, which is usually water. The proper equipment to use would have been a hydrometer, which measures specific gravity, or a liquid's relative density compared to water. We will get into that later, but I'm not sure how much correct science can be done when using the wrong equipment, you idiot. Okay, that's coming in at 212 parts per million tap water. Don't know what that means, it's just a number. It could be unicorn farts, it's just a tap, it's just a number. So 212 is the recorded density of this one. Wait. You just said you had no idea what the 212 meant, but now you're saying that it represents the density of water. 212 is a ratio that represents 212 particulates per 1 million molecules of water. It can only be used as a measurement of relative density when two requirements are met. First, the solutions must be identical. And second, the solvents must have an identical molar mass. Only then can you use a ppm meter to accurately compare relative densities. Since he never showed us the baseline reading of ppm in the second glass, his experiment by definition has nullified itself. But we will let this slide for now, as this isn't the only thing that Dr. Dumbass gets wrong today. Two hundred eight. Yeah, it's about 200. Then this one's about 300. Yeah, so it's 200 and 300, right? So one's got 100 more parts per million than the other. That tells me that there is a density variation between the two. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see what happens when this egg is dropped into here. It sinks and it's touching the floor. Let's take the egg out. Now we'll see what happens when we put it into a more dense medium. So whilst I was settling down, this was done last night because it takes ages for it to dissolve and it um, get to a point where it's saturated. And I've got some residue at the bottom that is salt. Um, so at the bottom at least it's getting relatively saturated. So I'm going to give it a stir to stir it up so that the uh, it evenly distributes a little bit better. Because what I'm hoping to do is get the egg so that it's just sat above the bottom of the thing. Some people will argue and complain and say that I've not, I shouldn't have stirred it, I should have left it as a gradient. It doesn't really matter. 
Because what we're trying to establish is, if the medium is different, does it make a displacement? Does it force a displacement? If it forces a displacement, according to Newton, there is force. Sleeping dipshit. Don't cherry pick Isaac Newton, because that's not what he said. Newton said that a mass will change its velocity, whether by direction or speed, if and only if an unbalanced force acts upon it. If gravity is pulling down on an object and another force like the buoyant force is pushing up on the object, then there is a balanced force acting upon the object. Now in your example, by adding the salt to the water, you are not only increasing the density of the water, but you're also increasing the buoyant force, causing an unbalanced force to be acting upon the egg, and the egg will begin to accelerate upwards. But, by all means, don't let me stop you from being stupid. This is just normal table salt from your favorite supermarket. Other supermarkets are available. We can tell that the density of the egg is equal to the part in the glass where the, the liquid is. What I'm now going to try and prove is that if I change the density of the medium, I will cause the, the uh, effect by adding salt. So if I can change it, because I'm manipulating, I'm the experimenter and I'm manipulating my presumed cause, my independent variable is the medium, if that egg moves, I've caused it. We know the parts per million is about 300. All we need to do is pour some of this in. Hey, what do you know? The eggs immediately moved. Didn't have to wait for that, did we? So, what's the explanation? Well, I'm going to measure this now. This isn't going to be much more above 300. However, if it reads anything above 300, then that'll do for me. Let's re how do I reset? There we go. So the density is reading around about 309, 308, 309. You can have a look at that on the camera if you want to zoom in. But I've just made the egg move. No, Lily, you didn't make the egg move. You simply changed the density of the solution. But by changing the density of the solution, you also change the buoyant force acting upon the egg. This is why the egg stops accelerating upwards when it reaches a point where the forces acting upon it are balanced. So what's the cause? Well, scientific method states that the independent variable is the presumed cause. And I presumed that changing the density of the liquid would, with salt would cause a displacement. Newton's first law of motion states that um, every object will remain at rest unless acted upon by a force. And I've obviously created a force. You have such a simple mind. You haven't created a force. You have manipulated an independent variable in the buoyancy equation. And by doing so, you have obviously increased the force that was already present. We will get into more detail about that in a moment. But let's let stupid be stupid for now. The density of the medium has displaced the egg. The egg moved. That's an accelerating mass. So therefore, Newton states that there is a force. I caused it with this. So in scientific, in scientific method, the cause of the displacement is this. I've caused it. I've manipulated it. I added the salt. It caused something. I did it. I'm within scientific method. If you assert that gravity in any way caused something in this experiment, that means you are adding a secondary cause adding by inference. If you add a secondary cause by inference, you fall outside of scientific method because you can't infer an extra cause when you've already got one that you've manipulated. Your gross misunderstanding of Newton's laws of motion and the scientific method should be classified as criminal. You are not inferring a cause if that cause is being completely disregarded by the experimenter. That means the experimenter is making up his own rules and therefore falls under the category of idiot science. Riley, why is the egg in suspension to begin with? Using only Isaac Newton's laws of motion, can you explain why the egg is not accelerating towards the earth like it would be outside of the water? You can't pick and choose when you want to apply the laws of motion, and when you do apply them, you can't pick and choose what the definition of the law is. This is pseudoscientific if anything was. You can't infer a secondary cause and remain in sci within scientific method. 
If you wish to move outside of scientific method, sure, be my guest. Infer that gravity caused in any way whatsoever the effect that we just witnessed, which was the egg moving. But you do so outside of scientific method. And we know by definition, if you are not complying with scientific method, you are practicing pseudoscience. Okay, so time to really start pointing out the stupid spewing from the idiot fountain wearing the chef's garment. First things first, how did the egg and salt get into the water without a force being present to move it? You see, Riley, you just can't apply the laws of motion when you want to. So if there must be a force present for mass to accelerate, and you can't infer that gravity is present, then you must explain how the salt or egg began moving to begin with. I am staying within scientific method, and I am using my cause and my effect relationship, and I am demonstrating it with using this. I've changed the density of the medium, and the egg has displaced. Within scientific method, the cause is that and only that. You cannot infer extra causes. That takes you outside of scientific method. So, in anticipation of any reaction to this, um, this experiment in the uh, video underneath, or the comments underneath, if you assert that there is gravity acting on this in any way whatsoever, you are outside of scientific method and engaged in practicing pseudoscience. Anthony Riley, please listen to me carefully. You are a fucking idiot. Your understanding and explanation of the scientific method is incorrect or incomplete at best. Let me give you an example. I form a hypothesis that if I press A on my keyboard, an A will appear on screen. I press A and an A shows up. Therefore, hypothesis proven true, right? Well, what about when the computer is turned off? Or what about if the keyboard is unplugged? Does that same hypothesis still hold true under those circumstances? Oh, it doesn't? So by not taking all factors into account, I've essentially proven nothing. Now, if you try to do your dumbass experiment in free fall, it wouldn't make a difference how much salt you have in the water. The egg will do whatever it wants. Only once you are no longer in free fall will your scientific experiment have any significance whatsoever, but only when you account for all the forces involved. Therefore, your science fair project doesn't explain shit, and you are an idiot. Unless you can show me a citation within scientific method that allows you to disregard the cause, the salt, the medium change, and then substitute an alternative one instead, or including, adding to, then you are outside of scientific method. You are practicing pseudoscience. Not a problem, idiot. Because according to Jove.com, a website dedicated to educational science, the experiment design is almost as important as the formulation of the hypothesis. Let me read a small section from their website covering the scientific method, and a link will be in the description for the whole article. Experimental design is another critical step in the scientific method and can have a great effect on the results and conclusions one draws from an experiment. Careful thought and time should be devoted to experimental design and minimizing possible errors. The experiment should be designed so that every variable or factor that could influence the outcome of the experiment be under the control of the researcher. In other words, your experiment means fuck all if it doesn't take all forces and factors into account. This clip shows that buoyancy is nullified during free fall. Therefore, your experiment means nothing until you can explain this observation using your hypothesis. And good luck doing that without the force of gravity. Just by way of footnote, it's interesting to think that the mass of the Earth is below this table. The huge Earth ball that we're supposed to live on. And that is pulling that egg down, isn't it? Apparently. Yet when I added an extra bit of mass to this, the mass in below the egg is increased. But for some reason the egg went up. Well, it's not our fault that you don't understand how buoyancy and pressure are related. You didn't necessarily just add mass beneath the egg, but you also added mass above the egg as well. By doing this, the force pulling down on the mass of water above the egg is increased, therefore increasing the force needing to hold it up. This increase in pressure is at all depths, which is not the same thing as increasing the density. In fact, the density of the water could be completely consistent top to bottom, and the egg will still float at the same level. 
This is because neutral buoyancy is attained when the pressure acting down from the surface of the egg is equal to the pressure pushing up to support the weight of the egg. For instance, if you put a second egg that's exactly the same in size and shape and perfectly on top of the first egg, both eggs will sink slightly, even though the density of the combined two eggs is the same as the density of just one egg. What has changed? Well, the total mass of the submerged eggs has changed, while the surface area at the bottom of the combined eggs has not. This results in an increased pressure pulling down on the eggs, causing them to sink until the pressure from the buoyant force is equal. Once the pressures have equalized, the eggs will begin to suspend again. If mass really attracts mass, why didn't the egg go down? It's a rhetorical question, I don't, I don't want any answer. Yeah, we already know that you don't want that answer. You have never wanted that answer because you're a gravity-denying flat-earth idiot. But why don't you ask yourself why the egg went down when you put it in the water in the first place? Or why did the salt move when you poured it out of the box into the water? You quoted Newton's first law of motion enough to at least accept these observations as needing similar explanations. This is why your experiment is pointless. You disregard reality as you please. And until you accept, explain, and include all aspects of reality, then you should give this experiment to an elementary child for their science fair project. Because any adult that thinks this is actual science is a fucking idiot. The effect was it increased a little bit of pressure at the bottom, which displaced the egg. It moved. Newton said there was a force. So I've caused it. I did it with the salt. Gravity didn't do it. It wasn't the independent variable, was it? Can you science, bro? Okay, so to finish this off, I'm just going to point out one more flaw in Dr. Dickhead's experiment, and this one is purely mathematical. If force equals mass times acceleration, which he accepts as shown on the screen, and density is a force defined as force equals mass divided by volume, then we can combine the two equations to say that mass times acceleration equals mass divided by volume. Canceling out the mass on both sides, we come to the mathematical conclusion that based on this hypothesis, the acceleration of an object is equal to the inverse of its volume. Now if this were true, then when two objects with the same mass were dropped in a vacuum chamber, where the only difference is that one object has half the volume, the object that is twice as dense should also fall twice as fast which is not what we see in reality. In a vacuum chamber, all objects of all densities fall at the same rate. Sorry, flat earthers, but the earth is not flat, and Sleeping Warrior is a fucking idiot. Back to you, Fight. Thanks, team. Guys, if you're not already subbed to Team Skeptic, then do that now. And also subscribe to our new channel, Science or Satire, where episode 1.0 will be after Sleeping Warrior Week. Anyway... A quick one before we go. If you think you've seen the limits of stupidity, then hold Sleeping Warrior's beer. You ain't seen nothing yet. This video he titled, This is what a solar eclipse should look like. I'll play the whole thing and um, I've added some music to keep you entertained. And so you, Sleeping Warrior, think that an eclipse should be the moon rising in the sky at a 45 degree angle, stopping for no reason on the sun for a little bit, then traveling off at 90 degrees, changing direction for, for no reason. And I'm done. The stupid burns. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this and come back tomorrow for the roast of Anthony Riley with me, Sean Hufford, Planner Walk, Geostriver, Conspiracy Cats and Team Skeptic. Like this video, subscribe and share and all that lovely stuff. And just before we go, I want to say a massive thank you to all my patrons. Your support allows me time to focus on my channel and do what's important, bringing you great content and fighting the flat earth. I want to say an extra massive thank you to my $200 patrons, Christopher Kane and Jeffrey Sloan. If you'd like to join and become part of the FTFE team, go to patreon.com forward slash FTFE. And thank you. Remember to share this video on Sleeping Warriors Discord and remember stupidity is not a right. Fight the flat earth. Fight the
Right. 